Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is Clusters as Cattle, how to seamlessly migrate your apps across your Kubernetes clusters. My name is Andy Goldstein. I work at Heptio. I've been a Kubernetes contributor for the past several years. I'm the tech lead for Heptio Arc, which is our backup and recovery tool for your Kubernetes resources and persistent data. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk a little bit about a history of developing and deploying apps over time. We'll talk about Kubernetes and how the pets versus cattle metaphor fits in there. We'll go over some app and workload migrations in Kubernetes, and I'll show you a little demo that I hope you'll enjoy. And at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So if you were in the 1940s or 50s and you were deploying an app, this is what it would look like. <laughs> this is a picture of ENIAC, one of the first electronic computers. It took up an entire room or more. And if you needed to develop an app or, and deploy it, you physically had to rewire to make your changes. Moving forward a little bit, we have some punch cards. So better than physically rewiring, but not exactly readable to a normal person. And it takes a lot of time to both program and when you're ready to deploy your app, you have to run it through a punch card reader, like you can see here with this IBM 704 electronic calculator. Fast forward past all of that, past mainframes, and we get to things like Unix and Linux and Windows. And now developing apps is easier, deploying apps a little bit easier, but getting access to those computing resources still isn't super easy. What you have to do at least back then, is file tickets. I need a new server. I need a new virtual machine. I need something deployed. And with tickets comes delays. You have to get things approved. Maybe multiple people have to approve it. So we're better than having to rewire physically, but we're still not there yet. So let's fast forward a little bit further to cloud computing. Now, anybody with a credit card can get fairly instantaneous access to a virtual machine without having to file a ticket to get it. But just like with physical servers before and with virtual, virtual machines and with cloud-based virtual machines, you still have to manage the operating system or have a department that does it. And if one of your virtual machines or physical servers starts acting up, you want to fix it as quickly as possible. This is your pet because you never know how long it's going to take to get this thing back working, so you've got to get it up as quickly as possible. You want to make sure that you have the latest operating system updates, and you want to make sure that if something does go wrong, you can recover from your backup as quickly as possible. OK, obligatory container picture. So beyond cloud computing with virtual machines, we have our containerization technologies, which are great. We don't have to think about the operating system nearly as much. We still do, but at least if you're developing an image for your application, you can focus on just what you want to fit in there. So if you're working on a web application, you put your web server and your content, most likely. You package it up as an image, and then you can run it, which is great. You don't have to worry about installing an operating system to make this happen. But when it comes to orchestrating where these containers run, it's still difficult. Maybe you have system D or upstart or some other init system. You can tell it, run this container on this node, on this server. But from a management and orchestration perspective, we're still not there. So fortunately, we have Kubernetes. That's why we're all here. So the great thing about Kubernetes is you can now really forget for the most part, about that infrastructure and where things are running. We tell Kubernetes, or more ask Kubernetes, deploy something. I don't really know where you're going to put it, because you get to schedule it. So as a person, as a developer, as an IT operator, you don't have to worry about that as much. That's what's great about Kubernetes. But what about the clusters themselves? Are they pets? Are they cattle? Do we need to? Uh, treat them with the utmost of care so that we make sure that they're always up and running. I'm here to tell you, you need to treat them as cattle as best as you can. So it's very important that you learn how to automate installing a cluster, adding a node to a cluster, and then migrating from an older cluster to a newer one. Up here are some tools that you can use. I'm going to be talking 
today about Ansible and kubeadm. So Ansible is a general purpose tool for running collections of tasks that have a, a similar purpose. You group those into roles, and then you can have multiple roles in an individual playbook, and I'll have an example here so you can see how that looks. So the first thing I want to show is this is a role that I've called Kubernetes, and it will, if I run it, create a one node all in one cluster. Obviously, that's a bit limiting, but for this uh, purpose of this talk, I think you can get the point, and then you can go and figure out, uh, there's great examples out there for doing multiple node clusters and for adding additional nodes to existing clusters. And what you see here is a default variables file for things that maybe I want to just have by default, my Kubernetes version, and if I don't override it, this is what I'm going to get. Once I have that set, I have some tasks. These are the real meat of what happens when I run this role. So the first thing I need to do is get my packages installed. I need kubectl, the kubelet, kubeadm, and Kubernetes CNI. Uh, I'm using Fedora, so I've got DNF up there. And when I run this task, it will make sure that these four packages are present on the machine. And the nice thing about Ansible is that it has, uh, it has states such as present and absent. And in a lot of tasks, such as DNF, present is the default. And so if I run this over and over again, it's not going to install the packages multiple times. It's just going to ensure that they're there. Once I've got my packages installed, I can use systemd to get my kubelet started and make sure that it's enabled so that as I reboot my machines, if that happens, that it will start up at boot time. And then here we have a template for kubeadm. And it's a template because I want to be able to change the Kubernetes version. So you can see up here, there's a templating language that allows Ansible to take either my default value, which was 1.9.6, or a version of my choosing to override, and replace that so that I can change the Kubernetes version that I'm installing without necessarily having to rewrite my role. You'll also see that I have a pod subnet for Calico, and I've decided that I want to use core DNS as well. Once I have that, I can use the template command to run it through the template engine, do the variable substitution, and copy it over to my remote server. And then finally here, it'll run kubeadm init using that template file to get phase one of my cluster up and running. But we don't have Calico installed yet, so we go ahead and copy the kubeconvig file that kubeadm creates to the home directory of my remote user. And then finally, I can go ahead and take the Calico YAML, copy it over to the remote server, and run kubectl apply on it. And when this is done, I have a fully functioning one node cluster. Now, I obviously left out a few things, but I do have all of this source code available on my GitHub repository with a link at the end. So you can go check this out and play around with it on your own uh, after this talk. And finally, to put all of this together, I have a playbook. And in this case, my playbook is called Cluster. And I want to run two roles with this playbook. The first one I just took you through some examples of. The second one installs the Contour Ingress controller, which will be part of a demo that I'll be showing in a minute. OK, so you've got your cluster installed. And you've automated your installation. So let's talk about applications. Hopefully, you have your applications, configurations, whether it's YAML or case on it or something else. Hopefully, you have that in source control. Uh, that's very important and something that we stress highly that you do. And, uh, but once you have your applications hopefully automated, you may need to migrate them at some point. So if you've got an application, you can't think that you're going to pin it to a specific cluster or a specific node in a specific cluster forever. At some point, the node is going to be decommissioned, or the pod's just going to get killed, or the cluster needs to be decommissioned, maybe. So we need to think that migrations are necessities, and we have to accept that and account for that. So when we're doing migrations, stateless, obviously, is easier than stateful. If you've got an app that doesn't have any state, it's pretty pretty easy to move it around. With stateful apps, I'd say that probably depends on the app itself. And so 
I can't give you a generic, this will all work for every single stateful app, but you can do things such as maybe put it in read-only mode, if you can accept that and your users can accept that. Maybe you have to take it offline for some downtime, or maybe you have some apps that can support uh, spanning multiple clusters with replication, for example, so that you can start to spin up new members in a new cluster and bring your old members down over time. So I do want to mention, uh, I said earlier that I'm the tech lead for ARC, and it's good for disaster recovery, but it's also really good for migrations. So we do on-demand and scheduled backups with ARC, and we back up as many or as few Kubernetes resources as you specify, as well as persistent volume data. So you can say, I'd like to back up one namespace or a bunch. You can say, I'd like only a certain subset of resources, so maybe just pods and services. And you can also use a label selector as part of that selection criteria when you're creating backups. We're also extensible, so if we don't have the exact behavior that you need, you can write a plugin for it. And as I mentioned, it's good for migrations. So you can take a backup of something in one cluster, including per, uh, persistent data, and then migrate it over to another cluster. So let's look at a scenario here. Let's say that I have an app, and it's running in a Kubernetes 1.9 cluster, and I want to migrate to 1.10, but I don't want to upgrade my 1.9 cluster. I'm afraid that maybe something goes wrong and I end up with a non-functional application or a non-functional cluster. So to avoid downtime, what I want to do is keep my old cluster, spin up a brand new cluster using the new version, and then slowly migrate users from the old one to the new one, but do it transparently so they have no idea that this is happening. Now before I get into that, and the demo, I do want to talk a little bit about networking inside of Kubernetes because it's relevant to how we can solve this migration problem. So if you're writing a client and it's running inside the cluster and you want to talk to another pod, you can talk to the pod by its IP address. So you could hard code that. A better thing to do is to use the DNS name of a service. So you put a service in front of the pod, it gets a DNS name. It also has an IP address. You could use that if you wanted to. And uh, if you're not familiar with services in Kubernetes, they have endpoints that are associated with them. And there's an endpoint for the pods that are um, working for that service. So this works great. But what happens if I, I lose my pod and my deployment replaces it with another one? I have a new IP address. So if I hard coded that, it's not going to work anymore. Fortunately, DNS still works, and that's what I would strongly recommend if you have an in-cluster client. But what if I have an outside client, like someone from the internet? I'm not going to be able to hit this internal cluster-only IP, and I'm not going to be able to hit the DNS for the service either, because that's local to the cluster. So. The reason that I mention this is that if I have just a single cluster and I, I have one way into it, and here's a solution, uh, we can put an ingress controller, such as Envoy and, or Contour to control Envoy, and expose that on the host network of the node that it's running on, and then make sure that from the firewall or, or wherever we're coming from the internet that we can get into that node. And we use DNS, a different DNS name. I'm going to use the Kubernetes up and running demo application here. And so I just made up a .demo domain name for this example. But we use a different DNS name and make sure that we have all of the, the routing connected so that we can get in this way. And the reason that I mention this is that this will allow us to come from outside the cluster into the cluster. And it'll allow us to swap out the clusters as well. So here's my solution. We have Kubernetes. We use Heptio Contour, which is an ingress controller for Envoy. We add a little bit of wildcard DNS. And so at the top, let me show you a picture here. I go ahead and I put in a routing cluster. Now, this cluster can be highly available. It'll run Envoy in at least one of the nodes. I'd recommend you probably have two clusters and you use some sort of IP failover technology to have them highly available. And you point DNS and make sure that it can get in to whatever node has Envoy running on it. And for my example here, I'm using this QWERTY.demo. And 
what I want to do is I want to be able to swap out where the applications are really running. So they're running in either cluster one, cluster two, however many clusters I have. And the whole point of this is that my routing cluster stays the same. I change the configuration a little bit, but I can remove and add backend clusters at will. And as long as there's at least one running, my traffic will continue to flow and my app will continue to function. So how do we do this? On the right here, I've got a representation of just a backend cluster node. I have Contour and Envoy running so that if I were to hit that, uh, hit Envoy directly, I'd be able to route it into that pod. But this is not exposed to the internet. It's my routing cluster that is. So if I add uh, Contour and Envoy to my routing cluster and I create an ingress object for my application, where does it route? How do we get this to wire all together? So what I have is some custom control logic that will look for special secrets that are labeled in a certain way. And inside each secret, I have two things. I have an IP address that represents um, the IP of this node that's running Contour and Envoy in a backend cluster. And I have a kubeconfig file that I use to talk to that backend cluster. Because what I want to do is I want to find all of the ingress objects that have a route equals true label. And this is all just an example. Um, you know, we can do this different ways, but for example purposes, I'm looking for route equals true. And when I find that, when my controller finds it, it adds a service and an endpoints object that are specific to that ingress in the backend cluster. And the endpoints object here has one IP address in it that points at that Envoy running in that backend node. And it updates the ingress so that I can actually route traffic appropriately. So here's what that looks like. If I come to qrd.demo, it's going to hit this Envoy up here. And it, Envoy is going to select a backend based on the endpoints that I have here, which point to the node in the backend, and then we flow all the way down to that pod. So demo time. Hopefully, the demo gods are with me. All right, so um, this is a pre-scripted but live demo. So I'm not typing, but uh, everything here is actually live. And I have some uh, helper functions here so that I can switch between different clusters. So for cluster one, I'm going to show you that we're running Kubernetes 1.9.6. And I have one node sitting there called cluster one. So let's go ahead and we're going to deploy Quarty v1 to cluster one. So I'm going to create a namespace called demo. And I'm going to use the kubectl run command to run this QWERTY image. I'm also going to expose it, which will create a service for me on port 8080. And so here you can see that output. And then I have an ingress file that just has QWERTY.demo uh, pointing to this particular service. So that's all created. Um, we can go take a look in the browser, and if we go over here, this is qrd.demo. I'll refresh it. It's not working because I haven't hooked everything up yet. So the next thing we want to do is we want to tell my routing cluster about this website that I want to have hosted. So I have a little helper command after I create this namespace here called r, and um, I'm going to add a vhost called QRD, and I have some defaulting in here. So this is basically going to say, let's, um, let's do QRD.demo. So what does this actually do? This creates an ingress, and I've um, abbreviated a little bit, but you can see that there's a namespace demo. The name is QRD. And I have an annotation here called weighted cluster. And this is just something that I did for the demo to tell Envoy that we're going to be doing some traffic shifting. And um, in particular, I'll point out, you can see I have this temporary placeholder up here for my backend service. This is because I haven't told the router about any of my backend clusters. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I add my backend cluster one, we can see what that did to the ingress itself. So instead of temporary placeholder, we now have this QRD cluster one service, which my routing controller created automatically for me when I added that backend to it. And if I go into the website and I refresh it, I now have the app up and running. And I can refresh a couple times, and you'll see that down at the bottom, this request ID changes here and there. So we just have one backend cluster and the application deployed there. All right, so 
let's hit, hit it with some load. So I have a little benchmarking script that's just going to run a five second load test against qwerty.demo. And this will show us how many requests came in and which backend they hit. So when this pops up, we had about 3,400 requests, and they all went to this one particular IP address, which is my cluster one. All right, so let's create a backup with Arc. So I'm going to go over to cluster one. I have Arc pre-installed, and I'm going to use the Arc backup create command to tell it I want to create a demo, or sorry, create a backup called QuarD, and I want to include one namespace, which is the demo namespace. So this submits a request to the server, uh, the Arc server, which will find it and process it. We can go take a look. I'm storing this in Minio. And here you'll see uh, I have a, a bucket called Arc, and I have a backup called QuarD. And this is what you typically see uh, inside for an Arc backup. So that's all good. And we can go ahead and uh, lo and behold, we have a brand new Kubernetes 1.10.1 cluster waiting for us. Uh, if I had more time, I would, um, I would spin this up with Vagrant and run Ansible on it, but I don't want to make you sit here and, and wait for that to happen. So I have this cluster pre-created. So we're going to go ahead and install Arc. And this installs Arc in uh, restore-only mode. So it's going to connect to the same Minio bucket that my original cluster was using, but it won't try and delete any backups for garbage collection or anything like that. So it's, it's purely restore or read-only mode. All right, one of the things that Arc does, um, if, I have, if I have backups in a bucket and I point a new cluster at that same bucket, all those backups, the metadata about them gets synced into the new cluster. So here you can see I'm in cluster two, and it says I know that this backup called QuarD exists, which is great. This is the migration part. So let's say that I want to go ahead and do a migration. First, we'll check. Let's make sure that uh, I'm not lying to you. There is no demo namespace in cluster two, so it's not found. And then let's restore from backup. So I'll run arc restore create. I give it the name of the restore that I like to call it, and I tell it which backup to create the restore from. So this takes a little bit uh, of time, not too long, because this is um, there's not much in there. But we can go ahead and check and see in cluster two if this worked. So we have deployments. We have the QuarD deployment. We have the service that was uh, restored. And we have an ingress for it as well. All right. So we're going to go ahead and add cluster two as a back end to my routing cluster. So switch back to the router. And I'll do r add back end cluster two. And let's see what happened to the ingress here. So what's important to see, let me scroll up just a little bit. Uh, we have some new annotations. So we can weight each backend in the cluster. And we can say, I want 100% of the traffic going to one backend and nothing to any of the other ones. Or you can divide it up however you'd like. One thing that uh, I chose to do for this demo is I want to make sure that the addition of a backend uh, a backend cluster isn't something that automatically puts it in service for receiving traffic. So you can see that cluster two has a default weight of zero. And uh, it's up to the operator, me in this case, to decide when it's time to bring cluster two into the actual routing picture. So let's give it 10% of traffic. So I'm going to run the annotate command with kube control, and I'm just changing it to a 90 10 split. And if we take a look at the ingress, you can see 90 and 10. And if we go look at um, Envoy, we can take a look and see Envoy has um, this concept of weighted clusters where you can, you can send different amounts of traffic to different backends. And so here I have 90% going to my cluster 1 and 10% going to cluster 2. So let's see if it actually works. I'm going to run the same load testing script. Again, it's hitting qwerty.demo. And uh, if everything works, this will send about 90% of the traffic to my original cluster and 10 to the second one. And so here you can see the one that ends in uh, .55 was our original cluster, and it gets the majority of the traffic. If I go into the web browser, uh, we can take a look. And you'll notice that the name of the pod here, if I keep refreshing, does eventually change. But again, because it's the 90-10 split, it's going to hit one of them a lot more than it hits the other one. All right, so now we're happy 
with our, our new cluster, and we can send all of the traffic to it. So I'm changing the weights so that cluster one has zero, and cluster two gets 100% of it. And we can double check the ingress to make sure that that looks good. So cluster two is at 100. We can take a look at Envoy's configuration. I'll refresh that, and we'll see that cluster two is now at 100. And one final test here, if we load test it again, this will do that same five second test and we should see that everything goes to the IP address ending with dot 56. And there we go. And uh, then finally, I can actually delete the cluster one backend and this will adjust the ingress so that now there's literally only a single service uh, as a backend for cluster two. And if I run the same load test, we'll see the same results where it only sends traffic to cluster two. Okay, uh, that is the end of my demo. Let me get back over here. All right, uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I don't know where that mic is. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Uh, so, uh, as I understand it, this is mostly for if it goes through the internet. What about the previous, uh, the first, second thing that you explained when you used the local? Yes. Sure. So the question was, um, was my routing demonstration just for traffic coming in from the internet, or could it work um, inside uh, in an intranet, for example? So um, with service DNS. With service DNS. Uh, so, let me get back to, whoops, wrong way. So when you look at this picture, um, this type of setup can work anywhere. It doesn't have to be on the internet, but from a service DNS with the service cluster local DNS, um, that works within a single cluster. And this is, um, you know, cross clusters. Uh, one of the things I did look at when I was putting the demo together was maybe trying to use the external name, uh, CNAME support that you have with services, and I just didn't get far enough along with it to see if it would work, but it's, it might. Anyone else? Yes? All right, so the question was, what do you need to do when you need, or what do you do when you need to upgrade the routing cluster? Uh, so I would recommend you have two, at least. And um, as long as you're using something like Keep Alive D with a virtual IP for the router itself, um, maybe you add a third cluster so that, you know, if you lose one and then you don't have one last man standing. Um, so yeah, Keep Alive D, have a virtual IP, and then you can upgrade as you need to uh, and take them in and out of service. Yes. Uh, can you forget about the routing cluster then and having the uh, functionality split on two redundant clusters the routing cluster functionality? Uh, so the question was, um, could we not need the routing cluster and just replicate the routing functionality in two or more clusters and also have the, the uh, backend workloads running there? I suppose you could. Um, it, it wasn't something that I was thinking about for this demo, but I think um, with some work, we can make it happen. In the back. Right. So the question was, if you're doing uh, Git operations and you have all of your uh, Kubernetes configurations for your apps and whatnot in Git and you deploy from Git, how do backups fit in? So um, when we were working on Arc, that's a question that comes up a lot. And uh, the way that we look at it is GitOps is great, but if you need to tie in persistent volume backups, it's a little iffy. Uh, so Arc can help you associate backups with your existing workloads and existing things that are running in Kubernetes. And what we would like to get to, if it's not there already, is being able to do a backup and restore and then continue to do GitOps beyond that point. Anyone else?
So the question was, does, do, does the ARC backup handle custom resource definitions or CRDs? Yes, uh, so ARC uses API discovery to ask the API server about all the API groups and all the resources that are there, and it's able to back up custom resources too. question was, would it be okay to do the routing cluster only when you need to migrate and then get rid of it afterwards so that for the most part you're just running a single cluster? Um, yeah, I guess you could. It, it would just depend on how you configure your ingress traffic from the internet or wherever outside the cluster is. You know, if it's one hop or two, you potentially could do that. Yes. Our backups encrypted at rest? Was that the question? Yes. Uh, so ARC supports, um, I believe with a AWS and maybe Azure, I'd have to go back and double check. We do support um, the cloud provider's encryption. We don't specifically encrypt anything, but we've had some requests for that, so we're uh, considering it. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, sorry, I couldn't see you. <laughs> Is, was, I think I heard you. Is, what's the advantage of having a routing cluster like this instead of using an ingress proxy? Or a reverse proxy? Um, I guess it depends on what functionality you get with the reverse proxy and where you want to control being able to do the, the weighting and the traffic shifting. Uh, the nice thing about this example is you can control it all within Kubernetes. And um, again, depending on the reverse proxy that you're using, you may not have the same sort of administrative capabilities from within the cluster. Contour with Envoy, uh, I believe we do, I know we do HTTP, I know we do TLS or HTTPS. Uh, I'm not sure about SNI support, uh, but it's, it's mostly going to be um, HTTP based or web based. Yes, in the back. Uh, so the question was, databases such as Postgres, how do we back those up? Uh, so ARC allows you to run custom hooks before and after we take a snapshot of a volume. And that's essentially a queue control exec into your pod. So if you need to freeze the file system and then take a snapshot and unfreeze it, uh, you can do something like that. We've also uh, been considering, but we haven't made much progress, the concept of something like an application profile or a you know, workload profile so that we could tell, you could tell ARC, this pod is a database pod and it's a MySQL pod or a Postgres pod and then we'd have um, preconceived logic for doing that sort of backup, but um, we're open to any ideas around that. Uh, it's just something we've only begun thinking about. Yes. Okay, so the question was, is there any concept about moving persistent volumes from one cluster to another? Uh, so we support that with certain restrictions. So if you're running on AWS, for example, if the persistent volumes are in the same region, we should be able to back them up and restore them within AZs in that same region. Um, with the other cloud providers, it may or may not work, but we are going to be adding a replication feature to ARC so that you can back up wherever it ends up and then specify via a policy that I'd like to replicate to regions one, two, and three. And uh, once that happens, you could then restore in any of those regions. Anyone else? All right, I will be around for a little bit after. Thank you very much. Thank you.